From the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, it's the opening round of the 1997 Supercross Series. Art Ekman, David Bailey, Davey Coombs with you. It's one of the most exciting beginnings to a season in recent years with four-time champion Jeremy McGrath switching from a Honda to a Suzuki. And it has added mystery and suspense to this great sport. We'll be taking a closer look at these developments later in the show. Right now, let's get to the racing in the qualifying rounds. The qualifying procedure this year, the same as last year, the top four riders qualifying in two heats go directly to the main event the top five then in the semifinals transfer to the main and then the last chance qualifier only two riders get a chance for the big money 20 riders will be at the gate for the 250s here in the starting heat number one and as we check things out the 32nd board is up and we're just about set to get right to the action the only guy here tonight art that, to my knowledge, has ever won a Supercross in L.A. is Damon Bradshaw. He's number 10, right next to the starter's box. We've got Phil Lawrence, Ezra Lusk, Mike Brown, along with Mike LaRocco. No, it's uh, Albertine, number 8, Albertine, as the computer system is down. Doug Henry is in there. Mike Kudrowski in his return. And the 1997 Supercross season is underway. Jeff Emig, number three. Jeff Emig, who had such a great year last year. Doug Henry fighting for second place, moves to the inside. And number 21 over the hay bale. That's Mike Brown. Mike Brown is off the track. Kyle Lewis, number 15. That is Michael Craig, number 15, moving into third with Bradshaw in fourth. All right, unofficially in practice, I had Doug Henry, number 20 there in second, the fastest in practice. He's been looking good all day, look good on press day. Right now, he's got a lot of pressure on Jeff Emig. As they come out of that peristyle, it is Jeff Emig with the freight train. Emig, Henry, Michael Craig, who's had such a great offseason, winning the final two world supercross races in Geneva and had a very fast practice session. He's putting the challenge to Henry for third. Damon Bradshaw in fourth, Albertine in fifth, and it's John Dowd in sixth place now on the Team Yamaha. There's Albertine, he's gotta be wondering, how the heck am I gonna pass these four guys? Everybody's going so fast, everyone looks so good in practice, it's just about impossible to try to pick a winner. Check out Doug Henry through the whoop section. Oh, Doug Henry to the inside, almost went over the front. Emig did a great job of keeping it upright. He knew it was going to happen, stuck his leg out to save it. Here comes Bradshaw making a move on Michael Craig. Bradshaw moves into third place. Oh, what excitement right off the bat here in the 1997 opener. Bradshaw on fire. A week ago at the Supercross Invitational at Goat Brackers, Bradshaw looked fantastic until he tangled with another rider and went down, but he's been looking strong all day. When you come off that six-story drop, Doug Henry, it scares me to death after that tremendous accident at Bud Creek that he's come back from the broken back. And Doug Henry, who's won one Supercross in his career, that was at Dallas in the mud, is leading our first qualifying heat. Emig in second place. And banging at the door is Damon Bradshaw, the last winner in, an, in the active field. Here comes Emig over the finish line jump. Doug Henry, a big mistake there right before the finish line. Mistimed that double jump, almost went over the handlebars, saved it. That allowed Emig to get by, and now Bradshaw. Here comes Henry! Oh, my goodness, the crowd on their feet here in the L.A. Coliseum. It's Doug Henry of Team Yamaha, Jeff Emig of Team Kawasaki, and then from the Manchester Honda field, it is Bradshaw with the Honda of Troy of Michael Craig right on his back bumper. Bradshaw just had me holding his breath, holding my breath, too. He almost went over the handlebars right before the triple, did a good job to get back his composure and still make the triple. Had he not, he'd have lost all that time and dropped a spot. And of course, the top four advanced directly to the main after our qualifying heat. And guess who's number five? It's Mike Kudrowski, number 100, coming out of retirement and has joined the Honda of Troy team. The first lap of practice today, Kudrowski went out there and attacked the track in the very first lap. Oh, what a slick move by Bradshaw and Emig. Emig boxes him out on the turn. A great block pass, and Emig is right back there in second place. 
Good to see Bradshaw back up there dicing with these guys. It's been a while since we've seen him do this. He's really got a fire back in his belly to compete, doesn't he? He's we got saw that in Japan in the offseason. Yeah, he had it almost uh, locked up until Albertine got underneath him in the final corner. He looks like Damon Bradshaw did back when he won nine races in a season. Albertine falling off the pace as Doug Henry leads with Jeff Emmy, Bradshaw, Craig, and Kudrowski. Can Henry hold on? Bradshaw keeping the pressure on. He's almost rubbing the knobbies off the Jeff Emmick's rear tire. And these top four have really pulled away. Now, do you think they'll settle in, try not to make a mistake? No, they won't. Damon Bradshaw. Damon Bradshaw makes the pass on Emmick. And here comes Michael Craig. Emmick wasn't able to do the triple. He lost his timing right there, and Craig was almost able to get around. So now Bradshaw's got a little space. A blistering pace. Well, Ken, who's going to win it? We don't know. We'll be right back here in the first qualifying round, and we'll find out when we return to the Los Angeles Coliseum. Welcome back to our opening qualifying round here from the Los Angeles Coliseum, round number one of the 1997 Supercross season. It is a surprise leading our first qualifying match. Doug Henry pulling a big lead now. It is Damon Bradshaw in second place. And it's Jeff Emming who finished second in the points last year. The only winner beside Jeremy McGrath in third place. Michael Craig in fourth. Those four would qualify if they stay the same. Craig now to the inside, got a really good drive out of the corner, and he's gonna control the inside coming to this corner, but Emmett gets a good drive and shuts the door. I think, David Bailey, it's not always just the top four that qualify, because with the particular starting gate we have here in turn one, it is very important to get a good gate position. There aren't that many good gate positions. You could end up in fourth in a qualifying heat and get a non-choice gate position here. True. I think for the main event, it's going to be a big advantage to be on the inside of the starter's box. Judging from Jeff Emig getting that whole shot and going wide, I don't know if we'll see the same thing again in the main event. Doug Henry, Damon Bradshaw. Damon is hopping over the jump after that peristyle. He's clearing all of it, making up most of his time there. Really impressed with Doug Henry. Looks like he did back in 95 when he won his first Supercross. Well, he was so excited for this season to start. He's, he told me he's in great mental shape as well as physical shape. And he's got to be a lot more confident now. He's, he's got a lot more confidence in his back. His fitness is back, his timing is back, and he's riding with that same aggression that he did back when he started challenging Jeremy late in the 85 season. There's Michael Craig trying to make a move on Jeff Emig for third and fourth positions. They've got those positions pretty well solidified, but as we mentioned, Craig would like to move up into third. These guys are starting to lose a little bit of time to the leaders now. Bradshaw closing in a little bit on Henry, and those guys are starting to pull away just a tad. I've been impressed with Michael Craig since I saw him on the World Supercross Tour in Geneva, where he was the only rider in the offseason to win two Supercrosses on the World Series Tour, and they were both there in Geneva. He won two races before in Genoa, Italy, in a non-sanctioned event. Now you can see Kudrowski and Dowd starting to pull up on these on this battle for third. John Dowd with Team Yamaha racing the 125 East season is running the 250 here on the Western Circuit. They've really closed the gap now on Michael Craig and Jeff Emig. That's a good, good, that's a good sign for Kudrowski. This is making his comeback. Oh, little bobble right there. Let's Dowd by. Still, Kudrowski looks pretty good. And the Supercross was never one of his strong points, never won that title. He's won a lot outdoors, but pretty impressed with this being his first race back. A three-time winner in Daytona, a winner in Seattle. White flag lap, it's the final lap now of our first qualifying round. Henry, Bradshaw, Emmy, Craig, and Dowd. And only four getting the transfer to the main event. I think that's a key point, David Bailey. It's nice to see Mike Kudrowski back up there banging fenders. He said he wouldn't be back if he didn't think he could win. 
he looks like he's got the the timing and the aggressiveness he looks pretty comfortable out there to do the job maybe not here in this heat race but he's definitely got on the pace a fitness fanatic and he's had time to get back physically to where he thought he was when he left racing now right behind doubting Kudrowski is Mike LaRocco number five starting to creep up from one of his bad starts back to our leader Doug Henry and what a premier opening round for Henry Bradshaw close enough to make a move in the final lap there's a couple of lapped riders here comes Bradshaw Bradshaw over the rollers can he get to the inside it's very difficult in the next timing section to make up any time on the leader Doug Henry taking the checkered flag. What a great move for Doug Henry. Kudrowski, LaRocco will have to go to the semifinals. We'll hear words from the winner, Doug Henry, and his impressions of his first race of 1997 when we come back. Number 20, Doug Henry, winning our first qualifying round with Bradshaw, Emig, Craig, and Dowd. It is Henry Bradshaw, Emig, and Craig advancing to the main event. Quite a surprise, David Bailey. Doug Henry looked fantastic. Let's go down to the floor of the stadium now. Davey Coons. Davey. All right, Doug. A lot of people out here. You are the surprise winner for this race. What was going through your mind out there? You had Emig on you and all these guys on you. You were on it. Well, I knew I just had to ride my own race. The track's great out there, and uh, I saw Kevin go out there and win, and I wanted to do the same thing. What's it mean to be back in the winner's circle, even just on the podium in a heat race here to Supercross after your injury? It feels great. You know, anytime you get up here on the podium and get to talk to all these nice people, it's great. <laughs> all right. Have we seen your best stuff? You're going to show us something else in the main event? No, I got a little more for the main. All right. Congratulations, Doug. Okay. Thanks a lot. There you see the checkered flag for Doug Henry and a very happy smile on the former 125 two-time champion and a 125 outdoor two-time champion, Jeremy McGrath, in new colors. It's pretty weird to see. I couldn't believe it when I first started hearing rumors that he wasn't going to be signing with Honda. I thought, no, this can't be right. But he sure does look comfortable out there on a Suzuki. It doesn't look like... Anything different in his style? He's still doing the same thing during practice. Practiced a lot of starts. He did a few things different than the other riders. Have you ever seen him so hungry with such a, a twinkle in his eye uh, since 1993? No, I, I would have expected to see him a little bit nervous. All the expectation, all the pressure in the media on this switch. And Jeremy looks as relaxed as ever. I think that's one of his real good qualities. The all-time winningest rider in Supercross with 43 victories coming into this year. Four-time champion, four consecutive championships. Steve Lampson, number four, the lone Honda rider in the 250 field. Lawrence Ward, Huffman, Button, Lampson, Lewis, Pichon, and they're off for our second qualifying heat. Pichon, number 27, to the inside. Lampson, a good start. On the outside, it's number nine, Ryan Hughes. Ryan Hughes and Lammy, one and two, with Jeremy McGrath in fourth position. Mikel Pichon in fifth. Ryan Hughes got bumped there. Did a good job to keep it upright. Hughes riding with a horrible case of food poisoning right now. And look at McGrath. McGrath passing Lampson. Lampson slipping back to fourth. McGrath going from fourth to second in one move. And he's following one of his best friends, Ryan Hughes, right now. Down to Paris Styles. Ryan Hughes, this is unbelievable. He woke up about 2 o'clock in the morning with food poisoning and never went back to bed. They tried to pump fluids into him during the uh, earlier qualifying rounds to try to get ready for tonight's action. Here's Lampson. Lampson moving into third. Lampson following his former teammate McGrath. He's got a good view of this battle for the lead. Doesn't look like McGrath anything different at all. This looks like last year. Going for the lead, putting pressure on Ryan. Ryan over jumping that finish line a little bit. Makes a mistake. Oh, there goes Jeremy McGrath. Taking the inside on Ryan Hughes. So it's McGrath. Hughes lamps him through the whoops. And Mikel Pichon making a move for Foyt. Jeremy McGrath with good positioning. I'll say, there's so many people doubting that he can win on a Suzuki with that incredible combination he had at Honda all these years. Oh! Pachon goes head over heels. Mikel Pachon fighting for third is down. 
It's holding his leg too hard. He took a bad fall right there. Mikel Pichon in his first year in 250s after winning the 125 title two straight years went to Team Suzuki and he is now down and hurt. Oh, that's terrible. You saw his leg get crunched right there between the jump and the motorcycle. He got a little out of shape right there and he just couldn't straighten it out. There was too many obstacles coming. Pashon, suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome last year, had to sit out much of the action to rest. And a bad break. We'll be back to see if Jeremy McGrath can win the first qualifying heat of the year in our second qualifying heat of the night. A friend of mine said I should try America Online. So I did. I've gotten help with my golf swing, planned my next vacation. I even get stock price updates every 15 minutes. America Online puts over 100 newspapers and magazines right on my screen. I've got worldwide email, point-and-click internet access, and a great web browser. Plus, new features keep getting added. New, unlimited internet and AOL for one low price. Jeremy McGrath is out in front in heat qualifying number two. But Ryan Hughes cutting in front of Lampson. We've got a great Fender Defender duel. Lampson taking second place on Ryan Hughes. Lampson got such a good drive off the back side of that jump. It kind of caught him by surprise. And that was what enabled him to get a little advantage over Ryan Hughes right there. Hughes only able to double. So Lampson now following his teammate. What's it like being the only rider in a big team effort like Honda? Well, I meant to say former teammate, and now I think Lampson has been like Scottie Pippen for the last few years, following McGrath around. I think like there wasn't a whole lot of expected out of him, but now if he wants that bike to smell different, they'll make it smell different. He's the only guy on it. Lampson, as yet, has not won a 250 Supercross. And, of course, Honda hoping that he'll step up to the forefront. Jeremy McGrath continues to lead on the number one Suzuki. Damon Huffman now starting to move up. He makes the move into fourth place. Now he's in a qualifying position, chasing down his teammate Ryan Hughes. Huffman very fast through the whoop section. He always is, using that long, lanky frame to skim the tops. So it's McGrath and Lampson one and two. Ryan Hughes and Damon Huffman three and four. Hughes, I believe, has got to be feeling the effects of what happened to him last night. They had to call the hotel doctor. Well, Tired in practice. Doesn't have any strength out there that's really starting to show. Normally, that would be Hughes' strength. Hughes, one of the great determined fighters in the Supercross field. Right now, he's holding on to third. Lampson starting to apply the pressure to McGrath. Crowd's starting to get into it. Lammy would love a psychological advantage going into the main event, that's for sure. Here it comes, Lampson. Look out. These guys are still great friends. I don't think there's any rivalry here. I think Lampson wants to get by him and prove something to McGrath. A little statement on this heat race. If he can make a move, that's going to give him a, confidence, a lot of confidence going into the main event. Huffman moving into third, getting around Ryan Hughes as we check out the battle for number one. McGrath still calm, collected. Rarely makes a mistake. The only place I see that Lampson is faster than Jeremy is through the whoop section. So if he gets close enough as they enter it, he may be able to make a pass. Jimmy Button has moved into fifth place now as we check out the leader, Jeremy McGrath. Uh, there's Gossel. Mike Goslar trying to figure out what to write down. He doesn't know if his writer's going to get around Jeremy this lap or not. <laughs> Jeremy starting he started to, to write something, bit. then he erased it. And there's Wyatt Seals. He's Jeremy's mechanic. They're standing next to each other. Lampson losing just a little bit of time right now. As time is running out in this eight-lap qualifying heat. Damon Huffman in third. As it looks like Jeremy McGrath not getting the challenge from Lampson. Brian Hughes slipping even further back. Now he's getting a challenge from Jimmy Button. Jimmy Button trying to move from fifth to fourth. Takes the inside route on Ryan Hughes, number nine. Right complete opposites. Ryan Hughes short and stocky. 
Jimmy Button, one of the longest, lankiest riders out there. Jimmy Button, quite a story, was between Suzuki in the 125 ranks for two years, went to Europe with Honda, and uh, had a very disappointing fourth place finish in the 125 Grand Prix. Then came back as a privateer, now is with the independent team of Chaparral. If Hughes can hang on to this spot, he'll transfer directly to the main, which is something he really needs, riding with a lot less energy than he'd like to have due to that food poisoning. Here comes Jimmy Button. Button moving into the qualifying space of number four. Jeremy McGrath still with about a five bike league lead on Steve Lampson. This is where Lampson's been quick. Jeremy relying a little bit more on timing through that whoop section in practice. Mike Gosler looking on. Can his rider Steve Lampson catch the defending champion, Jeremy McGrath? Back in 1993, McGrath did not win the first race of the season. In fact, it wasn't until the third race at Anaheim that Jeremy would win his first 250 Supercross. And then, of course, he went on to win the title his very first rookie year. All right, he's smart enough to know that he doesn't have to win this first race. He doesn't even have to win this heat race. It'd be a bonus. But when it all counts is in the main event, because the lap times here are a lot longer than usual, about a minute 10. Tightening up now, Steve Lampson. Main event's gonna be a long race. So conserve some energy, search for lines. Don't show Lampson anything that you might be able to use in the main event. And we haven't taken a look at the track map yet, David Bailey. We'll do that a little bit later, but this track is a lot longer than it used to be. Here comes Lampson on the finish line jump. One more lap remaining as the white flag hits the breeze. Jeremy McGrath puts his head down, leans over the bars as they go into the whoop section off the tabletop. We've got a great one here on the second qualifying round. Here comes Stephen Huffman making a move also. Jeremy McGrath, Steve Lampson has the edge as they go into the triple. It is bumper to bumper, bar to bar. Lampson now taking the advantage off the tabletop. Lampson let it all hang out right there, went a little bit wide. Jeremy, if he could have got over that double jump right there, may have been able to make a pass. Now they both got a lot of pressure from a fly in Damon Huffman. He caught these guys from out of nowhere. Damon Huffman coming off a serious injury of last year and had a lot of racing in the offseason. Here comes Damon Huffman. He's putting the push on Jeremy McGrath. Damon Huffman going bar to bar. Jeremy looks over to the side to check out the youngster on the move. A little bobble by Huffman. McGrath Jeremy... hangs on to it. I think what let him have that wheel on Huffman was he stayed a little bit lower off the triple. That's one of Jeremy's trademarks. The checkers are out. It is Steve Lampson. The lone Honda rider, Jeremy McGrath, and a great duel from Dustin, from uh, from David Huffman and Jimmy Button will get the final transfer spot here from the second qualifying heat. We've got a lot of riders that'll have to go to the semifinal round, including Larry Ward and Ryan Hughes. We'll be right back in a moment. Before we take a look at the four riders that are headed toward the main event out of our second qualifying heat, here was the tragedy of the heat. Mikel Pichon. You can see Pichon right there. Got the front wheel turned sideways. Wasn't able to jump over that double jump. He was completely out of control. And you see his leg right there. It got caught in a bad spot. Mikel Pichon, one of the few European riders who came to the United States to succeed in Supercross before making it real big in Europe. Here's the top four qualifiers. It should be Steve Lampson, Jeremy McGrath, Damon Huffman, and Jimmy Button. Let's go down to Davey Coombs. Okay, thanks, Art. I'm down here with Steve Lampson. You just won the first of a, probably a million battles you're gonna have with the old teammate. Yeah, that's for sure. Jeremy is riding good. He adapt, looks like he's adapting to the bike well, but uh, I just felt that much better. I had him a couple times. I just kind of let back a little bit. And uh, first race, so I'm not gonna do nothing stupid out here. Do you feel it all like the odd man left out? All this talk about McGrath and Han and all these things like that. Hey, you're a national champ too. Yeah, I know, and uh, it's not gonna make a difference to me one bit. And uh, I think everyone knows, you know, at Honda especially, they're all behind me. And, uh, you know, I give it 120% and uh, feel great. All right, well, congratulations, Steve. Thank you very much, Davey. Thanks. A tough break for this young man from uh, Le Mans, France. Oh, he was so excited, I talked to him before practice and he was so happy about the new bikes this year and and he was really looking smooth he yeah. had such good technique to begin with 
but it was the uh, chronic fatigue syndrome that set him back as far as endurance and energy last year. Uh, they worked very hard on a special diet, special conditioning to get around that ailment. He looked good in Europe. He had his timing back by the time the World Supercross season got underway. And what a what a sad moment right now for Team Suzuki and the fans of Mikel Pachon. From the Los Angeles Coliseum, we'll have an in-depth look at what went behind the Jeremy McGrath switch. We'll be hearing from the sport's winningest rider in a moment. Our Honda flashback takes us back in time to the last event held here in the LA Coliseum and the final round of the 1992 season. Damon Bradshaw had broken the record for the most wins in a single season at nine, but Jeff Stanton was close enough to take the title away. Brian Lunas could see that the pressure was getting to Damon, and he wasn't riding with the form that took him to those nine wins. With Stanton leading, Damon had to pass number five Guy Cooper to hold on to the title, but it was one of those days. Nothing went right for Damon. You could see it in his riding, trying to shake it off. But eventually, the former champion number one, Jean-Michel Bale, would pass Damon Bradshaw, ruining any hopes of Damon's first Supercross title. And for Jeff Stanton, the more experienced of the two in a pressure situation, it was a great day trailing all year, took his third Supercross championship at the final round. Los Angeles 92, a disappointing moment for Damon Bradshaw, an unbelievable joy for Jeff Stanton. Let's look at this year's schedule so you can plan on checking out this exciting action in person at the stadium nearest you. It's Phoenix and Seattle after two rounds in Los Angeles. On to Indianapolis and then south to Atlanta, Daytona. Daytona, part of our ESPN 2 series for the very first time this season on Minneapolis uh, March 15th before Orlando and St. Louis that was the site of McGrath's lone loss last year in the season wrapping up in Pontiac Charlotte Dallas and Las Vegas Art Ekman along with David Bailey and uh, gosh we knew the season was going to be exciting coming into it well it sure was but after the heat races with surprises from Bradshaw and Henry winning the first qualifying heat and then that great duel between former teammates Lampson and McGrath in the heat number two uh, it looks even more exciting for the rest of the year it's any indication and we're in for a great season and uh, I was really impressed with the way Doug Henry rode he reminded me of the way he looked towards the end of 1995 when he was challenging Jeremy in heat races and supercrosses before his accident he looks like he's back to that form and towards the end started to pull away a little bit but Bradshaw came back in towards the end he's looking like the Bradshaw of old as well Steve Lampson looks like there's no pressure on him at all to win even though he's the lone 250 rider in the Honda camp well it's amazing Honda you know they lose the best rider perhaps ever uh, and they roll in a brand new semi with one rider and they win the heat race already it's off to a pretty good start for Honda but Jeremy uh, it looked like his bike could be perhaps set up just a little bit better he didn't look like he was staying as low on some of the jump his uh, strong point or trademark rather and uh, I think he'll work that out before the main event he knows the main event is when it all counts and I think he may have not shown Lampson all that he has under his sleeve. <laughs> That's an interesting topic, David Bailey. Jeremy McGrath switching from a factory that had won 13 Supercross titles in 15 years and moving over to a bike that hasn't won a Supercross title since 1981. Why? Well, we went right to the source. <laughs> It uh, wasn't about a problem I had with Honda. It was just a little bit too strict for me. And uh, this, the, the way it is structured now, I can be me, and, and that's exactly how I got to the top is, is I'm able to be myself. You know, I, I like to do a lot of stuff. I like wakeboarding, snowboarding, surfing, you know, go-karting, BMX riding, I mean, everything. And uh, the, new, the new structure is I can do whatever I want to do, and, and that's the way I want it to be. As if Jeremy didn't have enough change in his life, his longtime mechanic and confidant Skip Norfolk retired from wrenching. Jeremy turned to another longtime friend. He and I met probably, I think it was 91, with the Peak team um, through Mitch Payton. And I was working for Jeremy Buell at the time. And, you know, we spent, spent a lot of time together then. I, I stayed at his house, actually. I wasn't living in California. So, yeah, I got some big shoes to fill, definitely. Skip's one of the best there ever was. And, and I know, like you said, you know, psychologically, he, he kept Jeremy going, you know. I mean, there was times I'm sure that Jeremy, you know, had some, some low times and Skip would pick him back up. 
and you know that's going to be something that I'm going to have to learn. And with Skip and I being friends, you know, I can I can talk to him, you know, and, and he can help me out, you know, and I don't have a problem with that at all. In the process of rebuilding Suzuki's 250 program, Roger DeCoster got a phone call from heaven, one that was hard to believe. The first call I got was um, uh, was Friday before Christmas. Uh, it was from uh, Dave Stevenson, his uh, his uh, business uh, manager. And I, at first I thought this must be, must be a Mitch Payton uh, prank call, you know, because Mitch is really up to a lot of that stuff. And I thought uh, I cannot take this serious. And, and uh, but they said no, no, and this is real, you know. And uh, and then the next call was from Jeremy and. And then I knew it was real, but, uh, you know, you still think uh, that it, there's no way that Honda is going to give up their main guy, you know, especially somebody like Jeremy. And I'm very happy with Jeremy joining us, but uh, I would look pretty bad if we didn't do good this season now. So the pressure is on, and uh, if we don't come off uh, with a good season this year, I better move to Australia or something, I don't know. <laughs> better go hide. For Honda, winner of 13 of the last 15 Supercross titles, it's regroup, turning back to the elements that made them great. I don't think there is any pressure on us. It's just that we know that uh, we took our focus off of a great champion. He did a great job for us. He's a you know a really neat guy, and uh, and we uh, we have Steve to to step in and, and do the job for us, and we don't feel a, a problem with it at all. With so little time to get things together, Jeremy McGrath has some bad news for the opposition. He feels great on his new bike. Finally, we're going to be able to see. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to put to rest the, the theory of it's the bike and not me. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it's definitely a motivator because, I mean, before, you know, before it's the same, same, same. And now with something new, I'm pretty pumped about it. I think for sure on my RM250, I can win a fifth consecutive Supercross title for sure. Let's hear from Davey Coombs for today's Dunlop Track Fact. Thanks, Art. I'm down here at the base of what has to be the most famous jump in the history of Supercross. This is the Peristyle jump. It all started here in 1972. A fellow named Mike Goodwin came up with the idea of the Super Bowl motor car. Off this jump, every rider from David Bailey to Rick Johnson, all the way back to Marty Chipes, they all came off this jump. And they say it's one of the biggest thrills in the history of the sport. This is the first time in five years we've been in Los Angeles. And I know, David Bailey, you had a lot of good things happen to you here, didn't you? fortunate enough to be able to win here in 1985 back when they had the two moto format and Davey I know you raced here and I'll never forget how exciting it was around that left hand corner and head through the peristyle and just drop into the stadium it was nothing quite like it in Supercross I know whenever I was here I raced in 1985 I went home on a stretcher with a broken collarbone but jumping out of that thing you jump into a, just an abyss it's totally dark you can't really make out the lights and everything because you have a hard time with your eyes but once you drop down in, you see these thousands of people in the stands. It's the biggest thrill there is in motocross, or supercross, I should say. Well, it's one of the great landmarks, Davey, that's for sure, in all of supercross history. And what makes one of the elements, which makes us happy to come back to the Los Angeles Coliseum, of course. The track a little different this year in our first round than we've seen in years past. I personally have never seen the track utilizing the entire field like it is today. 32nd board is up as we're getting set now for our first semifinal round. Ezra Lusk, Mike LaRocco, John Dowd, just a few of the riders that you would anticipate being out in front. And also got number 100, Mike Kodrowski in there. This looks a lot like a heat race. It's gonna be a tough semi. It really does. Albertine and LaRocco are right next to each other with number 13, Brian Swing, who's coming off a hand operation. Then you've got Kadrowski, then Dowd, Ezra Lusk, and Mike Brown, who took an unscheduled trip in the first qualifying heat. Number 11, Ezra Lusk, gets into the corner first. Kadrowski in good placement. Albertine, number eight, in second place. Dowd, number 14, in third, with Kadrowski on the outside in fourth. But it is Ezra Lusk in his first year with Team Yamaha, who has taken the lead. He gets the pressure from Albertine. Albertine looking really nice in the World Supercross Series as he took one of the seven victories. 
It also looked like he had one of the events in Paris wrapped up until the final corner where he made a mistake. And even though he lost that race to Larry Ward, still gave him a lot of confidence because he knew he had the speed to win. And then his win in Japan really solidified that. Our leader, number 11, Ezra Lusk. It was obvious also in Europe that he likes his new situation at Yamaha. He likes the, uh, the bike from the moment he got on it during the offseason. And now back in the battle of the third, John Dowd is getting some pressure from Mike LaRocco, number five. LaRocco with Team Suzuki starting the season for the second year in a row, coming back from injury. He's trying to recuperate right now from a shoulder operation and is about one week away from really being 100% uh, physically. Well, you never want to start the season that way. You can see him through the whoops there. Dowd's been fast through there. Morocco just as fast, maybe even just a little bit quicker. I watched him all through practice. He's looked aggressive all day, but uh, not getting the starts and having to come from behind really doesn't show the kind of potential he has in his speed. He's always having to work his way through traffic. Lusk made a little mistake before they headed up the peristyle, but he's still in contact with... Greg Albertine, who has been riding a lot with Jeremy McGrath. I noticed earlier today, I talked to Jeff Stanton also in Ward. He looks a little bit better on the bike. His style's a little bit different. I have to think that he's soaked up some of Jeremy's tips. Albertine is our leader with Ezra Lusk in second place. And the battle really is for that transfer spot. We've got John Dowd in third, getting pressure from Mike LaRocco. And Mike Kudrowski's coming up on Mike LaRocco with Brian Swink behind them. Number eight is our leader, Greg Albertine. Albertine really throwing a win away in Paris and then coming back in Tokyo on the offseason to take a victory. Here's the battle for the lead right now. Number eight is on the move, Albertine. He lost the lead briefly after the finish line jump, made a mistake, but he muscled his way back past Lust through the whoop section. Swank has moved into fifth. There you see Albertine number one, but Ezra Lusk not willing to let him off the hook as they go up the peristyle. Pretty impressed with the way he looks. Real relaxed, a little bit better style. Sometimes the guy's riding gear, they just change the color of the sleeve. It looks as though they're holding their arms different when they aren't, but uh, I've really watched Albertine all day, and he looks much better on the motorcycle. Probably a combination of riding with Jeremy and the fact that that bike is working even better. David, remember 95 and 96, dislocated shoulder in the preliminaries in the opener, both years in about the same location before the main event in Orlando. Bad breaks for Greg Albertine, but right here, there's his mechanic, Ian Harrison, giving him encouragement. A crash down in the corner, and that is Swank, number 13, along with Mike Kudrowski. Mike Kudrowski now is forced with the idea of maybe going to the last chance qualifier. Brown has moved into fifth place on the cusp. We'll be back with the finish of this great action from our semifinal round in a moment. Picking up the action in the semifinal round, let's take a look back now at what happened between Brian Swink and Mike Kudrowski. Kudrowski went in on him. Kudrowski did the right thing. He went in there to the inside, tried to take the, the spot away from Brian Swink, but they got connected. It took a long time for both of those guys to get going. Kudrowski actually had to do a donut. Now he's got to work his way through the pack. Hopefully he won't have to go to the last chance qualifier. Albertine said he has learned so much over the last two years, but now has the confidence to win a Supercross race. Albertine, Lusk, Dowd, LaRocco, and Brown are top five. Bad news from the medical area, David Bailey. It looks like Mikel Pichon in the qualifying rounds has a broken left femur. Well, that's a devastating blow to Suzuki because Mikhail, Mikhail Pichon is riding the 125 East Coast. And chances are it's going to take him a while to heal from that. Out in front, Albertine with number 11, Lusk, battling it out with Dowd right now. And Mike LaRocco... It looks like he has firmly secured the final transfer spot in fourth position. Number 21, Mike Brown, a little distance away, is look, looks like he's destined for the last chance qualifier, of which only two riders come out of that heat to make the main event and run for the big bucks. 
Albertine still feeling the pressure from Lusk. They have their favorite spots on the racetrack. Albertine will pull away here and there, and then Lusk will close back in. Look at this action. Oh, my goodness. The picture is worth it all. Albertine barely holding on to the edge. Ezra Lusk being very careful, though. Ezra's had a lot to learn himself as they hit the checkered flag, and it's Albertine Lusk down LaRocco and Brown advancing to the main event. The official results and a word from our winner in a moment. All right, Greg, who are you? Where'd you get these clothes? I've never seen you ride that smooth in American Supercross. Well, I've been here two years. I think it's about time I learned something, and uh, it's been a tough two years for me, but I've been having a lot of fun and uh, just making progress all the time, feeling more and more comfortable. Yeah. Now, Art and David up in the booth said that maybe this had something to do with you riding with McGrath. Did that practice have a lot of good effect on you? Well, you know, Jeremy's such a smooth Supercross rider, and the only thing that can happen is I can learn things. And uh, I've been riding with him twice. He's been helping me out, and uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, as you can see, I'm making some progress, so I feel good. You're making a lot of progress. We'll look for you in the main event, okay, Greg? Thanks. I'm going to hopefully get a good start and be up there. Thanks. The three-time world champion, it's obvious David Bailey. He's having fun on the track now for the first time in, in a couple of years. Well, he's having a lot more fun than he has the past couple of years in the season opener, for sure. We're glad to be back here in L.A., but nobody happier than Albertine to get out of Orlando. Going to the last chance qualifier, Brian Swink and Mike Kodrowski along with Mike Brown. So we're just about set. Taking a look now at our Steiners for the second semifinal round of which the top five will go to the main event. There you see Ryan Hughes resting on his elbows as we take a look at our Suzuki trap mat. Well, for the first time in a long time, they're able to use the entire floor of the Coliseum plus the addition of the peristyle. It makes the lap times a lot, a lot longer, about a minute 10. The first turn turns to the right, very short, small, tight first corner. I expect to see some pileups there. And another added feature this year is on the top of your screen, a double jump leading into the triple. The riders say it's a little bit tough to pass out there, so it'll be interesting in the main event. Our second semifinal. They've started the engines. And a lot of hopes on the line now in starting this 1997 season. Round number one from the Los Angeles Coliseum. We've already seen some unbelievable action in our qualifying heats. Battles with Henry and Bradshaw. Lampson winning against his ex-teammate Jeremy McGrath. The 32nd board is up and we're almost set to go. Brian Hughes, Phil Lawrence, Kyle Lewis, just three of the better known names battling to get into the main event. The top four, of course, would go to the main event in the qualifying heats, but the top five will go to the, to the main event out of this semifinal round. Larry Ward also up in there, just to the right of these guys. And Ward coming into the season for the second straight year with a slight injury. It's Ryan Hughes, number nine. He's got a good start on that Kawasaki. Can he hold on, though? Larry Ward, number six, in the second spot. Ryan Hughes hoping to transfer out of that heat race so he oh. doesn't have to use any more energy going through the semi. Kyle Lewis almost got boxed out. He's now in third, number 16. So you got two riders out front that both are suffering, suffering from ailments. Ryan Hughes, of course, with the food poisoning or some kind of sickness. No one knows for sure. And Larry Ward just got a pin taken out of his ankle. No one expected him to even be here. He went out and rode a few days ago, said he felt good. Why not come out here and try to steal a few points in the first race when everyone's still trying to get the kinks worked out? It's the first race of the season. In fourth, number 990 is Matt Shue out of the state of Georgia. Our leader is Ryan Hughes. This is the second place machine, Larry Ward, number six. In a battle with Kyle Lewis, the former Mickey Thompson champion in 94-95. He's on his way to Japan with a lucrative contract in April. That section leading up to the finish line jumps getting a little tougher each lap. In the face of all the jumps, there's ruts. Picking the right one. As soon as you land, you're in another jump with more ruts. Larry Ward getting a little off balance that time. Number 122 is Lee Hogan, incidentally, from Australia. 
who is trying to make his way up to fifth spot and going down. I believe it's Shu in fourth position. As we take a look at the leader, Ryan Hughes holding on against Larry Ward. 2D injured Warriors now trying to hold on to get into the main event. You can see back behind Lewis, it's quite a long ways back to Hogan. His three is starting to open up the distance now, pushing each other. Jason McCormick has moved into the final transfer spot here in the second semifinal round. Right now it's Ryan Hughes looking strong Come when you take into consideration he was so sick last night got no sleep at all. Larry Ward it's phenomenal he's where he's at after ruining some tendons in his ankle and breaking a bone in his leg at the practice track in the offseason. Ryan Hughes continues to have trouble with his timing on the finish line jump over jumped it again. It's like jumping out of a two-story building, landing on the flat ground. It takes so much strength. And another mistake by Larry Ward. Keeps it on two wheels, holds on to second. Almost went off the racetrack right there. That's the same section where Pershawn had trouble. Very technical. Here's the battle for second. Kyle Lewis, number 16. Former teammates from Team Nolene. And at that time, of course, Larry Ward placed second in the points battle that was the highest a privateer on an independent team had ever placed in supercross history second to jeremy mcgrath that season brian hughes has got to be hoping these guys take each other out or get involved in their own battle and give him some breathing room so he can relax a little bit we saw marshall plum the new mechanic for larry ward on honda of troy's team urging him on as we have Ryan Hughes still holding on with Larry Ward, number six. Kyle Lewis, number 16. Lee Hogan is in the fourth spot. And it's still Jason McCormick in number five. And he is being challenged right now by number 12, Phil Lawrence. So the final transfer spot now has uh, changed places. Phil Lawrence into fifth. Brian Hughes still got the pressure from Larry Ward. Lewis that time losing just a little bit of time up in the peristyle. Brian Hughes gunning that Kawasaki now into the double before the rocker that places them into the triple. You can see the riders in the summer that coming right out of the corner to get enough lift to get over these double jumps without a run they stay sitting down on the bike in order to preload the suspension and get more rebound and clear those doubles who will win this run hughes or ward we'll be right back with the answer in a moment welcome back to the los angeles coliseum we are in our second semi-final round where the top five riders will advance to the main event it is the white flag lap final lap brian hughes has led this entire heat but Larry Ward is right on his tail. And it's Kyle Lewis, number 16 and third. Ryan Hughes getting a great drive through the whoop section that time. Gets a little bit of breathing room on Ward. Hogan and Lawrence are battling it out for the final two transfer spots. And it's Lawrence through the whoops really giving a big challenge as we take a look at the top three machines going up the peristyles. Everyone's starting to favor that inside now. You can go either to the inside or the outside around that big column. The fastest line seems to be developing to the inside. David, what's it like when you get up on top and you see that cement column? Well, it's pretty narrow up there, Art, and it's a little bit darker than the rest of the, uh, the racetrack, and that corner's flat. It's the only corner on the whole racetrack that's completely flat like that. A little bit of flat tracking up there, a totally different style. You'll see those guys sitting way to the outside of the seat like a flat tracker to try to get traction. We've got a great battle now for first place in the final lap. The checkered flag is out. Here comes Ryan Hughes in the semifinal round number two. He will garner the checkered flag with Larry Ward in second place. And cruising to third will be Kyle Lewis. We'll be back with a word from our winner in a moment. Welcome back to Los Angeles, and here's the official roster out of semifinal number two. Ryan Hughes, Larry Ward, Lewis Lawrence, and Hogan advancing to the main event. Let's go down to Davey Combs. Thanks, Art. Rhino, that was a gutsy ride, man. I know you're not feeling well. Yeah, I ate last night and got food poisoning. Uh, 
Yeah, I think someone tried sabotaging me last night, but yeah, I feel all right, just real weak. It's hard for me to concentrate. It seems like my brain's kind of going a little slow, and you know, I'm out there just trying my best, so we'll see what happens. How much do you think you got left for the main event? Well, I'm good for the half, so hopefully I can pull a little lead and then try resting, but you know, like always, I'll give it everything I got. Okay, go get some rest. Thanks a lot. Hey, David, didn't you go to dinner with Ryan Hughes? Yeah, Art, I did. And I, <laughs> I feel Coming, up, <laughs> Coming up next from Los Angeles, the young future superstars, the 125 main event when we return. Motorcycle Mechanics Institute, quality training for the motorcycle industry. While we were away, our Suzuki LCQ results, Ryan Huffman and Mike Chamberlain, one and two in the last chance qualifier, filling out the final two positions at the gate for the 215 main. It's get nervous time. Now for the 125 riders, they've just finished their parade lap. Number one, Kevin Windham, the defending 125 Western titleist, is at the gate. There you see his eyes. Game face on, David Bailey, one of the future greats. A major upset, don't you think, if he doesn't retake the crown? Well, I, it looks to me like the way he rode in the heat race, he could probably go down in the first corner and still have a legitimate shot at winning this main event. There's a few other guys out there that could challenge. I was pretty impressed with Casey Johnson and Robbie Raynard. Raynard getting back on track. He's had so many injuries in the past, and uh, if he can stay healthy, he may be a threat to, pitch to uh, Kevin Windham for this championship title. You've seen our Suzuki starting grid. There's Craig Decker. What a courageous return for this young man who had three podiums in 1995 in a practice late in the season at uh, Las Vegas. Cased it, crushing two vertebrae and cracking one in each side. There's the signs for Decker. 30-second board is up. So Decker is riding with the T3 through T10 fused in his back. It doesn't really affect his mobility because that's around the rib region. But uh, what a courageous effort, David Bailey. Well, it's uh, Doug Henry has proven that it's possible by winning his heat race uh, that you can come back from a seemingly career-ending injury uh, with a lot of determination. The hearts are pounding now. The engines are revving. And we're set now as getting caught in the gate was Casey Johnson. Number one, Kevin Windham is where he ought to be, but he's getting some challenge right now from number 24, that's Robbie Raynard. Robbie Raynard takes the lead right out of the whoop section. Don't look back, here comes Windham. Number 72, Rusty Holland in third place now as the 125s are underway from the Los Angeles Coliseum. And that's exactly what Raynard had to do, attack Kevin Windham, take him out of his rhythm, interrupt his pattern. Windham likes to get the whole shot and run away. Raynard attacking him right through the whoop section. That's going to give him a boost of confidence, however... Wyndham's got patience. So really, childhood rivals coming out of the amateur ranks are battling it out right now. Raynard starting to pull a little lead on number one, Kevin Wyndham. Well, Raynard out of Norman, Oklahoma. I don't think Wyndham would be too concerned with, with dropping off the pace a second or two. He knows it's a long race. They got a pretty big lead over third place already. Robbie Raynard coming back from a broken neck last season, has had a string of injuries since he turned pro at age 16. He really goes into this season telling me, I have no expectations. I just want to ride as best as I can. Probably a good philosophy coming into the season. There's been so much expectation in the past, perhaps led him into making some of the mistakes that he's made. When he is on, he is untouchable. Plate going on. It's Brandis, number 33. This is obvious something. It's obviously something it was brewing. And Rusty Holland. Brandis and Holland. Right at the end of the whoop section, trying to take each other out. Not happy about it, obviously. Wayne starting to close up now just a little bit on Raynard. Looks like we're gonna have a great battle for the lead. Here with the 125 main, as all alone in third place is number 586, Chris Wheeler from El Cajon, California. But it's Robbie Raynard on the Primal Honda, currently in first with Wyndham right on his tail. About you know, eight seconds back to third place, David. You know, Art, the interesting thing is about both of these riders is they both seem to ride very effortless. They're very smooth. Neither one of them. The Bucks. 
He got him in the box, and here comes Robbie Raider coming right back out of the triple, bar to bar. Windham with the great speed and the acceleration goes into the para. Well, that was a risky move. Windham jumped over the top of that plateau. If his front wheel would have gone about two feet farther, he'd have lost the front end and done a complete endo. Oh, what a great battle. Robbie Raider now in second place. Casey Johnson has moved up to fourth. But we've got Wyndham in first place, the defending 125 Western champion. And Robbie Raynard looking just to put in a good performance. As I was starting to say, both these riders are so smooth. Neither one of them, a lot of times, look like they're trying very hard. You'll notice both of them stand up through some of the corners. Both coming up through the national outdoor ranks and uh, motocross as amateurs and both getting numerous titles as amateurs in the motocross scene. Robbie Raynard having more trouble adjusting to Supercross than Kevin Windham. Uh, I think it's been a little bit more due to injuries and he hasn't been able to show us his potential. Outdoors, these riders are tied in national victories. They each have four national wins under their belt. But in the Supercross, it's pretty obvious that Wyndham with that number one plate has gotten it worked out a little quicker than Raynard. Wyndham has got his timing down. He is very smooth. It'll be interesting to see now conditioning wise. Wyndham should have a little more endurance than Robbie Raynard. Robbie Raynard, his father, is not his mechanic for the first time since I can remember. Tom Wallace of the Primal Honda team is doing the wrenching for Raynard now. The way Wyndham got around him, I would have expected. Maybe he took a look at Raynard, figured out a few of the lines that places that uh, he was making up some time and learn. It would probably pull away, but now Raynard is staying glued to him. If he can do that and keep the pressure on, later in the race they're going to encounter lappers and anything can happen. He's got to stay close, though. We're taking a look at the leaders right now. Kevin Windham and Robbie Raynard. And it'll be interesting to see who can come out the number one winner in our first round of the 1997 season. We'll be back to find out. And the run for the checkers continues in the 125 main when we return. 1900 Pro Race, up to the minute race results now. Bar to bars and go over the triple. And Pingree right on his tail, tries to box him out, does so. Kevin Wendell. Call 1 900 Pro Race. Bradshaw coming up now to challenge Doug Henry. Oh, Pingree goes down with James Dobb. 1 900 Pro Race is absolutely the best. Oh, what a bar to bar battle we've got going. 1 900 Pro Race, except no substitute. Coming off the Paris Styles, Kevin Windham is getting the big challenge from Robbie Raynard. Welcome back, Art Ekman, Davey Coombs, and David Bailey with you right now for the 125 main, the first one of the year. Windham, Raynard, Wheeler, Decker, and Lytle is your order right now. Raynard made up some time for the Paris Style. He was right on the rear fender of Windham. Then before the triple, he made a mistake, couldn't get over the double. Windham opened up the lead again. If Raynard can close that gap, we're going to have a run to the finish because that'll prove that he's got the speed to catch Wyndham. He should be able to stay with him for the remainder of the race. Kevin Wyndham with a flawless ride right now. And a battle is pursuing for third behind these two leaders. Johnson moving into third. Wyndham has been awesome through the whoops all day long. Yesterday during the practice, he was out there with the 250s. Faster than most of the 250s. But Raynard has got that Honda dialed into the whoop section. It's about dead even. Is it much different being on a 125 going through the peristyles like we see right here? Well, I talked about earlier how it's a flat turn and tend to flat track it through there more. You can muscle that 125 around there and keep the throttle a little bit more on. Kevin Wyndham on the move into the whoop section. Still got about the same lead that he had the last lap. Raynard not losing any time. That one mistake really cost him. He's got to keep the pressure on Wyndham, or Wyndham can run this pace all night. Over the finish line jump. Wyndham starting to pull a little bit of lead now on Robbie Raynard. As right now, let's take a look at the Honda stopwatch. Both these guys electing to go different lines to the whoop section. Wyndham now about a three-second lead as they go into the triple on the near side of the stadium. But look at the distance between second and third. 
as you see number 32 in the picture. And that's Casey Johnson. Doing a great job of working his way through the pack. Wyndham's starting to open it up just a little bit now over Raynard. Another thing that the Honda stopwatch will tell us, David Bailey, is uh, what a long track this is here in the Coliseum. Typically, the lap times are just under a minute, 58 seconds, some of them even quicker. Daytona being a little longer than most. But L.A., now that they're able to use the entire floor and the peristyle. Wyndham has picked up a second on Robbie Raynard in second place. Earlier this afternoon, the track lap times were about 110. Exactly. And right on the nail. Craig Decker moving into fourth. What a fine opening round performance for Craig. There's 141. Craig Decker on the Pro Circuit Kawasaki. What a comeback for him. Out of Palm Desert, California. Even if he didn't even have an injury, Art, he just stayed out of racing that long, it would still be tough to get back in there and put in this kind of performance. Really impressed. Decker telling us before the race, I'm just anxious to get this first one out of the way. But he says, I do expect to get back on the podium before this season is over with. Well, he's only one spot away. Reaching up to pull a tear off, that's about the quickest one I've ever seen. <laughs> Decker, you'd never know that he had that broken back and sat out last season. He went over to Europe to get tuned up for this season and did very well. David Pingree was over in Europe with him. Wyndham now got about a four-second lead over Robbie Raynard. This may be a point in the race where Raynard tried so hard in the beginning he may have tired himself out. Let's go down to the uh, Coliseum floor now. Davey Coombs is with Kevin Wyndham's mechanic. Thanks, Aaron. I'm down here with Allie Seymour. Allie, Kevin's got a nice size lead, a little bit of pressure from Renard early. What's he got left for the rest of the race? Uh, he's got plenty left. He's been training really hard, and he can ride for 30 laps if he had to as fast as he's gone. So he's been training really hard. Let me ask you this. He's been riding the 250 at all in preparation for those other races? Uh, no, he rode a 250 in Japan a little bit, but we've been riding 125 for about, uh, about well, since we got back from Japan for about a month now so uh, looks like his strength is definitely up yeah he's doing a good job so I got a uh, six laps left so we'll see thanks David as we take a look at Robbie Raynard in second place moving in third Casey Johnson remember David he's the one that got stuck in the gate what a job he's come back for well fortunately for him the first corner is so tight it was such a jam he didn't come out too bad. He was able to take the inside, picked off about half of the pack in the first half a lap. He put on an incredible, incredible charge since then, all the way up to third place, but he's about a mile behind the two leaders. This has got to be a big confidence boost for number 24 in the Primal Honda, Robbie Rainer. And there you see the battle for third. It is still tight and still coming on strong. Casey Johnson. Can he get a test from Craig Decker? Are what happens sometimes in the case of Casey Johnson. He, he worked so hard in the early laps to try to get back up with the leaders. May have used a lot of energy, and now he's starting to feel those effects and the pressure from his teammate. Decker's just inching up a little bit each time. Mitch Payton, I don't know. He's got to be on his pins and needles right now. Looks like either way. One of, one of his riders is going to end up on the podium tonight. Not on the top spot, doesn't appear, but he's got to be pretty happy with having these, one of his riders on the podium at the opening round. And both these guys look like they'll be able to, to challenge the leaders through this series. Casey Johnson uh, fishtailing a little bit, and Decker pulling up. But Decker seems to lose a little bit of space as they go into the peristyles. Decker holding on this time around. A lot closer now. Casey Johnson is going to start feeling this pressure, and he'll have to start protecting his line. He won't be able to take the outside and maintain his momentum. And they're going to be start catching up to some lapped riders here in a moment. Of course, number 32 in front 
As a white flag comes out, Kevin Windham is already into the whoop section on our final lap. Look at the smoothness of the rider, our leader. He has the luxury now of about a 10 second lead. He can just cruise this last lap. I'd look for a heel clicker. And the battle for third continues. Decker getting even closer now. That whoop section was a great opportunity to pass in this racetrack. The rest of it's pretty tight. It's going to take an aggressive move to get by. Decker, of course, racing at risk after that broken back, giving it his best here in his premier race of 1997 after a year off. You can see there's a lap rider right in front of him. That's Tommy Clowers. He's still taking that fastest line. It doesn't look like he's going to get out of the way. That could be to the advantage of Decker. Kevin Windham, our leader, is ready to approach the checkered flag as we see this battle for third still continuing. And you see Decker wasn't able to do the triple right there, lost a lot of time. Here comes Kevin Windham. The checkers. And our first Supercross winner of the 1997 season, the 125 Western champion defending his title. We'll be right back and get some words of wisdom from this young winner right after this. The time has come for our opening for the 250 Supercross season for 1997. 37,706 fans here in the Los Angeles Coliseum awaiting this exciting start on the season and just happening to drop by the former tuner for Jeremy McGrath, Skip Norfolk. What's it like being a spectator, Skip? Well, actually, it's it's pretty different being up in the stands and looking down on the track and then not being standing down there on the track and looking. It's it's, it's a different perspective on what actually is going on. It's uh, I slept better last night. I, I wasn't I wasn't worried about what I had to do for today's events, but that's about the only positive. It's 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 really different. You know, with with Jeremy, uh, Getting second in that heat race, and we never had the luxury of knowing what his behavior's like. How, how do you think he's going to react after finishing second to uh, Lamson in that heat? Actually, it's probably some of the best thing that could happen. His arms look like it pumped up a little bit, and that, that's good. Now he knows that's over with. He can just concentrate on racing. It's kind of an icebreaker or something to get him motivated and kind of relax him. Should be good for the main event. Right now they're on the line as we take a look at the Suzuki starting grid. Number one. That's Jeremy McGrath, of course. Number three, right next to him, Jeff Emmy, the runner-up last year and the only rider to defeat Jeremy McGrath throughout the entire 15-race season. Right. The second board is up. We're just about set to get this underway after some great, exciting qualifying heats. Uh, we kind of expect this main event to be even more exciting, David Bailey. I would expect to see number 17, Damon Huffman, if he can get a decent start. A real threat to win this main event. He caught Jeremy and Lampson in that heat race from out of nowhere. So he was the fastest guy on the racetrack. We've there he is. We've got a lot of fast riders on that gate right now. Getting set. Damon Huffman, number 17. Jeremy McGrath leans in. They're starting to rev up. And the season is underway for the 250s. It is Jeremy McGrath on the inside. Emig to the outside. McGrath is tied up in turn one. He has an atrocious start. Out in front is Jeff Emig, number three. Steve Lampson down in the first corner. He and Jeremy both getting tangled up. Bradshaw went down. He was in second place at the time. What a bad break for all the top three guys. McGrath down again before the peristyle and Emig. Pressured by Albertine. Brown and... Uh, McGrath ran into each other. Lampson just passing Jeremy McGrath in last place. Meanwhile, out in front, it is Jeff Emig. And right behind him is Greg Albertine. Albertine and then Henry, along with Larry Ward. Michael Craig is after Ward. So a Honda of Troy contention there. Boy, what a Jeff Emig out in front. What a gift for Jeff Emig right now. McGrath. Lampson and Bradshaw, three guys that were on fire in the heat race, all at the back of the pack now. Great opportunity for Albertine to win. Oh, Lampson and McGrath went down again. Lampson making the contact in the corner. 
McGrath holding up his arms like, come on, that's twice now, Steve, come on. Yeah, those, you know, those guys had to work together. They need to go up through the field. That's not going to happen now. All they can hope to do now is just salvage some points, not drop too far back in the series standings. The worst finish ever by a winner of a Supercross season in the opening round was Jeff Stanton. A seventh place finish, and he came back to win the title that year. Otherwise, nine of the 21 champions won the first round. Smooth, focus. Jeremy is telling his rider, Emig, who's starting to pull a little bit of a lead on Greg Albertine now. Albertine's going to start feeling some pressure from Henry, who's starting to sneak up from behind. And Larry Ward, somebody would nobody really expected to even ride this main event, will start creeping into your screen. There you see him, number six. Who'd have thought a guy that just had a pin taken out of his ankle would be running the number four spot at the opening round? Huffman starting to make a move from behind, too, as we take a look at Larry Ward challenging for a fourth position. This is exactly what he had hoped for. He told me, he goes, hey, nobody's really dialed in. So many weird things go on in the first round. I might as well try and ride, just salvage some points. He may end up on the podium. And you have to give a lot of credit to a guy like Ryan Hughes, who's just in it for the points after such an illness last night. He says, hey, I'm just going out there and trying to collect some points. Well, he didn't know things like this might happen, that he might finish in front of Lampson or Jeremy McGrath. There you see it, Emmy Galbertine, Henry Ward, and Ezra Lusk. Now, let's go to Skip Norfolk. Hey, the one thing that these guys have an advantage over is both Jeremy and Steve are way back. They're not going to gain too many points. These guys have opportunity to pick up 20, 25 points on these guys, and that's something that points are hard to come by. Coming down to the end of the season, this race could make the difference in the championship. Jeff Emig is our leader. Can he hold off Greg Albertine, Doug Henry, and Larry Ward? That's the top four. We'll be back after. Welcome back to the opening round of the 1997 Supercross season. A three-way battle really for first place now as Emig seems to be tiring a little bit. He's making some mistakes. And it's Albertine, number eight, right on his tail along with Henry in third. Ward is in fourth. Button has moved up to sixth while we're away. Jeff Emig, 250 national champion, 1996. The world supercross champion last year as well. 125 national outdoor champion in 92, trying to hold off the three-time world champion, Greg Albertine, number eight. Greg Albertine to the inside, a bar to bar battle into the triple. Albertine has the speed and the momentum. Neither one of these guys realize probably what's happened behind them to Steve Lampson and Jeremy McGrath. And like Skip said, what a huge advantage in the points. And typically these three guys uh, up in the front aren't usually there at the beginning of the year. It takes them a while to get going. It's a huge advantage going into the season. You're going in just excited and happy, and now you're up front racing for the win. What, a, what, a, what an advantage those guys have right now. Well, we both knew that these riders would come into this season with some momentum because of Albie's win on the World Supercross scene, Emig's fine performance, uh, as well as the Motocross the Nations victory on that 500. But Henry is the one that surprises me. We didn't see much of him in the offseason. He did go to Japan. But Henry is holding so true after winning the first qualifying heat and is right in good position here in third place. Let's check in with Davey Coombs. Yeah, hey, thanks, Art. I'm down here with Jeremy Albrecht. This is oh. Jeff Emmick's mechanic. Hey, does this surprise you at all? Albertine, where'd he come from? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. But, uh, you know, it looked like Jeff will start Cates and stuff. He's making some mistakes. I don't know if he might have hurt his wrist or something, but he's, he's coming up scooping now, and he's not riding like he was. So, I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell at this point, but I hope he picks it back up here in a little bit and starts going again. Okay, he hadn't given you any signals or anything? No, not really much that we can see. You know, everyone's kind of wondering. We're talking on the radio trying to figure it out but 
no one can see anything that really is telling us that he's hurt, but he's falling back a little bit, so might be. All right, thanks, Jay Bell. Now you get back to work. Thanks. And the important factor, of course, is Steve Lampson is in 14th, Jeremy McGrath in 15th, guys. Yeah, Jeremy's just right now, he's got to be frustrated. He wanted to so bad to come out here and just have a good finish and try to win the race. He wanted to win so bad. I, I, well, I, I don't want to be inside his helmet right now. He's not a happy person. Doug Henry really starting to put the pressure on Emig. While we were at commercial, Emig made a mistake. His throttle hand came completely off the handlebar. He saved it, put it back on. Here comes Henry to the inside. Emig goes down. Ward moves into second place as Relusk blazing by for third. I wouldn't want to be inside Emig's helmet right now either, but it looked like maybe he had made so many mistakes. I would think that was arm pump. And it's just gotten worse from there. This is it. Watch, watch his right arm. Oh, this is the pass for the, this is where he falls. Henry hits his front tire. Nothing he could do about it. He needed to put on the brakes right there just a little bit, let him get by and try to keep it on two wheels. But Emig is just off his timing right now. Henry has a shot at Larry Ward. I mean, it. Craig Albertine. Yeah, Greg's kind of out there but all front by himself, just kind of riding his own race. He has no pressure. Greg's a good rider when he has no pressure. Albertine doing a fine job of holding off the competition after getting a good lead in Tokyo. Jimmy Button and Huffman have been going at it in back of the pack. Albertine, Henry Ward, Luskin, Button in that order. The battle for fifth place is on. Huffman so much faster in the whoop section, takes the inside line. Lust tries to square him off, but Huffman had the momentum. Huffman has those long legs, and that bike just works underneath him, and he doesn't even know what's going on. He is incredibly fast in those hoops, unbelievable. That used to probably worry you, didn't it? Every weekend. Damon Huffman coming back from that horrible ACL uh, accident of last year. Probably raced more races in the offseason than anyone. Well, the man on the move right now has got to be Huffman. He also got about a mid-pack start. He's been slicing his way through. He can see up to Larry Ward and this long straightaway. Number five, Mike Guaraco of Team Suzuki. Albertine Henry, Ward, Luskin, Huffman are top five. Guaraco typically faster towards the later stages of the races. Still has time to move up more. Here's our leader, Greg Albertine. Albertine, it was obvious by the interview earlier after the semifinal round, and he is having a lot more fun this year. He's got a sense of confidence. He told me after giving away the race in Paris that it gave him the confidence, though, that he would be able to win a Supercross this year. He then came back in Tokyo in that same series to capture his very first Supercross victory ever. And he certainly has looked tonight like he's learned his lessons well. He hasn't made a mistake yet that I could see, except for right there. I shouldn't have said anything. He just dabbed his foot in the ground. He wasn't able to get over that double, but he still has enough of a cushion over Henry. Shouldn't, it shouldn't bother him very much. Five-second lead on Doug Henry, and Henry is starting to pull it up a little bit. Larry Ward still in third place. They're kind of in the middle of the race right now. They're kind of settling in, trying to figure out who's doing what and where the, each other's faster, faster. And Larry Ward's starting to maybe kind of just hang in there, but we got, looks like Ezra Lusk here, maybe trying to put a move on the third place here coming up. Our Honda stopwatch is underway. And Doug Henry is picking up some space on Albertine as they run through the lappers. Oh. Albertine, Henry, Ward, Lusk, Huffman, and LaRocco. Now you can see what happened to Emick, 16 seconds down from where he once was. Had a golden opportunity to win or perhaps end up at least on the podium. Like Skip said, notoriously slow at the beginning of the season. Bradshaw with a great start. Outstanding qualifying heat some 25 seconds back after going down. Steve Lampson just now going by. Almost 40 seconds down. Lammy trying to get around at Ryan Hughes as we go back to our leader to check out the lap time. Greg as Albertine. I mentioned earlier, David, it might be interesting to see how the comparison is with the 125s on this long track. 
Looks to me like he's just cruising now. I don't know if that's because he's riding a lot smoother than usual. But he's got a pretty good cushion over Henry. He's starting to inch up a little bit. But I don't think it's enough to, to cause Albertine to make any mistakes. Slower than the 125s, 111. That tells you how good Wyndham is. A little bit easier to muscle a 125 around than a 250, however, still faster, a second a lap. Going into the season, we know we knew it'd be interesting with Jeremy McGrath changing bikes. But I'm not so sure I thought it'd be this interesting <laughs> after the first round. It almost looked like the three stooges in the first first couple of corners. Lampson and McGrath getting together twice, Bradshaw going down. Pretty wild. Never Huffman. would have expected it. Number 17, Damon Huffman, now in fifth place. I think these guys now are just starting to kind of settle in. And, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, racing going up, heads-to-head -head racing going up. And they're just kind of going, you know, first race, I'm in first, I'm in third. They're just kind of settling and going, hey, this is way better than I've been before, especially on Mr. Albertine's part. Damon Huffman starting to make a move now on Ezra Lusk, number 11. Lusk in fourth place so damon wants to move up the ladder the young man from acton california the two-time 125 western champion who put together a string of six straight wins in 1995 is looking for his first 250 victory but what a nice movement he's made up through the ranks and here they come into the whoop section watch damon huffman like skip said using those long legs up the inside and lusk responding there's Huffman with the pass. If he's close enough to anybody through that whoop section, unless they're in his line, he's going to make the pass. And you can see Lust trying to take different lines and get him back. He's about five seconds in back of Larry Ward in third place. Still the battle rages on, though. Ezra Lusk not letting him get off the hook. Out in front of these guys, Albertine's starting to open up a lead over Henry now. You know, we were thinking about a possible Suzuki victory with the four-time champion Jeremy McGrath on a Suzuki, but could this be the first Suzuki win Supercross since LaRocco in 91 with Greg Albertine? Well, I, I think you're really starting to see some of the talent of a three-time world champion that we haven't seen over here in the United States. He, he, right now, he's having a flawless night. Well, he made it through the heat race without breaking his collarbone for the third straight year, so... It's looking a lot different. Everybody I talked to, I mentioned before, I already talked with Jeff Stanton and Jeff Ward. They were watching practice. I said, does Albertine look different to you? And they both shook their head, yes. Well, many riders have won their first Supercross in their opening round of a season including Mr. David Bailey next to us. I yeah, lucked out in 83 and won the opener in Anaheim. I don't think anybody expected it. I didn't. I was just hoping to finish in the top five. Had kind of the same goals that we've heard from Damon Huffman. Just trying to get through the first few races, feel things out, like Skip said, and then start to put on a charge and won it. And from there on out, it's a great season and went on to win the title. And we may see this from Albertine. No goggles on McGrath now. Yeah, that's not a good sign. Goggles off. It's uh, it's hard to pass those guys when you get up on them. as Roos and Dirk flying. It's not a good sign. Horrible night for Jeremy. It looked like it was going to go great. Looked like he had the whole shot. Maybe he played it a little too safe. It looked like, same as in the heat race, he tried to break and tuck it around the inside to protect that, and Lampson ran into the back of him. And From what disaster. we've seen here in the early going in this first round, it really means there's a lot of riders that could win this year. And, and being as far back as Jeremy is in the first round doesn't mean that he might not contend. No, I mean, he's won a lot of races, and he knows how to win races. But you can't count him out. The one thing he's always had in his favor is he's always been at the top every race. The other thing I've noticed, too, is he's, if he's ever had a bad race, he always bounces back and just demolishes the field because he's so angry. He'll probably want to be race, not wait till Saturday, next Saturday, but want to race tomorrow night. He'll be so frustrated with what happened here. So he definitely had the speed. Uh, I think he's got the equipment underneath him, too, from what it looked like in the heat race to win. Well, if he's got the same equipment as Albertine, Albertine is our leader, number eight. Another Team Suzuki rider has moved into the top five. Mike LaRocco is behind Huffman. 
Doug Henry starting to close in a little bit on Albertine. Conditioning might play a very important role toward the ending of this great first round from the Los Angeles Coliseum. Only seven riders in the history of Supercross have won their first ever super event in the first round of a Supercross series. But Doug Henry is looking for his second Supercross victory. He's putting on the charge. Huffman with a problem. Damon Huffman trying to get that bike restarted and get back into the action. Right at the end of the whoop section, that's where he was making up all his time. Went down. That's going to cost him a shot at the podium. And Albertine has lost a lot of time to Doug Henry. Two got, laps ago, he had a big lead. Yeah, you got to kind of wonder, maybe he's getting a little nervous. He's never been in this position before. Yeah, the last time I remember him in this position, he gave it away to Larry Ward in Paris in the final lap. Right now, Henry is within three seconds of our leader. We might have a great race going on here. The Our best thing Henry Ward, Larocco, and Lust. The best thing Henry can do is try as hard as he can to keep the pressure on Albertine. If he doesn't have any pressure, like Skip said, he'll ride fine. He won't. He won't make any mistakes. As soon as he's got pressure, the same way Larry Ward put it on him in Paris, he could force him into a mistake. And this could be an unbelievable story, especially after those who saw that accident in Bud's Creek, Maryland, where he broke his back and came back after uh, really a miracle surgery to even ride again. But to get his second victory would be a tremendous story. Awesome view from behind going out to the peristyle. You can see the crowd at the complete opposite end of the stadium. It is free fall. It's a little dark up there. These guys are jumping three quarters of the way down. Probably falling four stories. I think one of the worst things for Greg Albertine right now is Doug Henry can physically see him. He's, he's going to put on a charge here towards the end. Larry Ward is kind of in a lonely third place right now. The rider out of Florence, South Carolina, got his one Supercross win in his native state of Washington at the Kingdom in Seattle. In 95, he had a great year. Second in the points race, the highest ever for a privateer. He was with Nolene at the time. And last year, he had a second place in Charlotte. He's trying to hold on right now to a third place finish in the very opener of this season. I was walking around after practice, talking with some of the riders and went over to Larry. He was just full of himself. He just, he goes, yeah, look pretty good, huh? What do you think? <laughs> for a, for a, a guy that injured, just got a pin out of my ankle. How am I looking? I go, you look great, look aggressive. And well, he had a noticeable limp. And people were wondering, not just the broken leg, but the torn tendons in the ankle. That had to be one of the worst uh, situations to have to recover from. But a very credible performance from number six, Larry Ward. The laps running out. I asked Larry, I said, does it hurt your foot in any place on the track? What if you come up short on a, one of the triples or over jump anything? Does it hurt your foot when you land? He said, no. He was completely surprised by how good it felt out there and probably a little bit surprised to find out that he's got a great shot at making the podium at the first round. Right now, here is our leader. Emig is back up to sixth place, incidentally, as we take a look at Craig Albertine. And he got a little off balance that time, a little over the bars. A oh, mistake would be uh, tragic right now as Henry is drawn to two within two and a half seconds as they go up to the peristyles. Yeah, any mistake right now is going to cost Greg quite a bit of time because it's towards the end of the race and it might be something, a big mistake right now, just burst that bubble he's riding on right now. And it's not a good thing. Any mistake from Albertine, there's his mechanic. He's crossing his fingers. Ian Harrison. Any mistake from Albertine is going to let Henry draw right up to his rear fender, and that's going to really apply the pressure, force him to take different lines than he's been taking. LaRocco is now in fourth, and Ezra Lusk right behind him in fifth. This is the battle of the race right now. We'll get back to Albertine if Henry should draw any closer, but Albertine is starting to draw a little bit of lead. White flag lap right now as Albertine goes across the finish line jump. This is the final lap. This is the most nervous lap Greg Albertine's ever put in in the U.S. Supercross. I can almost guarantee you that. <laughs> He's still got a pretty good cushion. You can see them going the other way. These guys jump past Lusk. 
Trying to stay close enough to keep the pressure and force LaRocco into a mistake. He has a strong three-second lead as he tries to get by the lapper. There's LaRocco and Lusk in a battle for fourth. Because of the additional 10 seconds or so to the lap time, this main event's about three minutes longer than usual. So you can guarantee these guys are tired right now, and you can see Lusk and LaRocco both get a little out of shape through that whoop section, out of their rhythm. Henry has picked up a half second coming out of the peristyles. We're taking a look at Mike LaRocco. Is this the final lap? Yes, it is. And it's Greg Albertine out in front, going through the rockers at the end of the track. He doesn't have far to go for victory. Greg Albertine, can he gain his first Supercross victory in the United States? Albertine, through the timing section, takes the checkered flag. Roger DeCoster has been, got to be going out of his mind. Ezra Lusk battling with Mike LaRocco. Mike LaRocco holds him off. Going through the timing section. Can Lusk beat him across? No, LaRocco edges him for fourth place. Larry Ward finishing in third. What a great first round victory for Greg Albertine for the Los Angeles Coliseum. We will be back to hear his happy words. Right now, your Suzuki dealer has the ride you've been waiting for and the financing to get it. And by Honda, the winners of the last nine straight 250 Supercross championships. Honda, come ride with us. We are back in the Coliseum as we see, well, maybe a frustrated, if not disgusted, Jeremy McGrath after crashing several times. And uh, I believe, Skip, this might be his worst finish ever. Yeah. It's not going to be, he's not happy at all. But it's been a long, hard road also for Greg Albertine. Albertine's first American Supercross victory, Suzuki's first Supercross win since 1991, and their first win in Los Angeles in 16 years. Greg Albertine, Henry Ward, our podium appearances. Let's go down to Davey Coombs. Okay, thanks, guys. Greg, I am so happy to say welcome to the Winter Circle. Man. Thanks, man. It's so good. It's been such a tough two years, and I just want to give Jesus Christ all the glory for giving me the talent to race with these guys. It's just great to be up here. It's been a hell of a tough two years, but man, when you win it, it's all worth it. I'm so happy. Well, David Bailey says he's not going to say a bad thing about you again. Art says congratulations. Everyone's really happy for you. Did you even expect this? Well, you know, I've been working harder than I've ever worked before, and, uh, you know, all my sponsors, Suzuki's been great, 1-800-COLLECT, SPY, BFE. You know, just everybody's really been great, and uh, with the bike's fantastic. Jeremy's helped me out with some riding tips. And, you know, it's, it's got to come together sooner or later. My motto is never give up, and it's paid off, man. All right, well, congratulations, and thanks for never giving up. Thanks, man. A great victory for Albert. A disappointing loss for Jeremy McGrath, his first opening round loss since 1993. How much will this erode Jeremy's psychological hold on the rest of the field? Gentlemen, David Bailey, Davey Coombs, and Skip Norfolk, I think it's going to be one tremendous 1997 season. You see there, Roger DeCoster running toward his rider. A fine victory. R. Dickman for David Bailey, Davey Coombs, and Skip Norfolk. Happy you could join us for the 1997 Supercross opener. We'll be right back here next week for round number two, a rematch at the L.A. Memorial Coliseum. So long, everybody.